Hi friends, how are you today? I hope you're having a wonderful day so far. My name is Bailey Sarian and today is Monday, which means it's murder, mystery, and makeup Monday. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you're new here, hi, my name is Bailey Sarian and on Mondays I sit down and I talk about true crime story that's heavy on my noggin and I do my makeup at the same time. If you're interested in true crime and you like makeup, I would highly suggest you subscribe because I'm here for you on Mondays. Okay, so can I just tell you something really, really quickly? So for Halloween, I had some two other <laughs> ideas planned with like full like body painting, you know, just trying to take it up a notch. And I was, I was really overthinking it yesterday. And I was like, I don't know because the next two stories I'm doing are like, pretty gruesome and I just feel like painting my body while doing so, it doesn't, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. <laughs> you gotta have boundaries somewhere and I just was like, you know what? I don't think I should save it for like TikTok or Instagram. I'm just telling you that because if my makeup looks are gonna be a flop, you know, it's because I changed everything last minute. But hey, we're here for the stories and the makeup is an afterthought. Just letting you know, before we jump into today's story, we do have a sponsor, a huge thank you to ExpressVPN for partnering with me on today's video. If you don't know what ExpressVPN is, well, they enable users worldwide to protect their privacy and security online. Yeah. No matter where you are or what device you're using, a single ExpressVPN subscription, they've got you covered. ExpressVPN has a network of ultra fast servers across 94 countries, giving you plenty of options to choose from. When you're connected to any of their 160 server locations, you get a different IP address and keep your whereabouts to yourself, incognito. People can be real nosy out there, so ExpressVPN, they keep your location secure. Whenever you hop onto your computer or your phone, your device has a unique public IP address. So when you're surfing the interwebs, big tech companies and websites can use the IP to personally identify you and trace your activity back to you. And then they sell your data to a third party company without you even knowing. They know everything about us. We don't know anything about them. It's very not cool. Incognito mode is not enough to protect your information, but with ExpressVPN, your IP address will be hidden and your network data will be rerouted to a secure server to a location of your choosing. For example, when I hop onto the World Wide Web, I just do a little swippity swap of my location to one of ExpressVPN's recommended servers and Viola, I'm in a new location. It's easy to use with just one click. I can be in New York, Italy, or the UK but unfortunately like not really, which ugh, I wish I could teleport me there, right? Another cool thing about ExpressVPN is when you switch the locations of your server, you can securely stream or download content from anywhere, anytime on every device. You can also gain access to content exclusive to certain countries. Like it can grant you access to Netflix UK where I can watch shows like Rick and Morty or South Park. So whether you want to gain access to content available only in other countries or just protect your IP address, it's no brainer to choose ExpressVPN. Find out how you can get three months of ExpressVPN for free by visiting expressvpn.com slash Bailey Sarian or clicking the link in the description box down below. A big thank you to ExpressVPN for partnering with me on today's video, but most of all, a big thank you to you guys because without you, I wanna be here and I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Today's story is pretty gruesome. Just a little disclaimer. So I'm sure you're aware, but people are not always what they seem. Someone you may think is like super nice on the outside, you know, like, oh my God, I love them, great. And then you have no idea what's really going on in their house, uh, hiding in their closets, or maybe even below their floorboards for that matter. Today's story is about a family man who was like involved with his local community. He seemed to be very well respected um, in his neighborhood and his friends loved him. And he would even spend his free time volunteering at hospitals and like charity events. And sometimes he would do so dressing like a clown to entertain kids. You may be familiar with this story. That's right, we're talking about John Wayne Gacy. 
So John Wayne Gacy was born on St. Patrick's Day, so March 17th, 1942, to a man by the name of John Stanley Gacy and his mom, um, Marion Elaine Robinson. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, what do you expect? Me to pronounce everything correctly? I don't think that's how you say her name. It doesn't matter. But John Wayne Gacy, he was named after John Wayne, the Hollywood actor, super famous for all the Westerns, which side note, not long ago, I went to an estate sale and um, it was like not far from where I live. And it was the home of a John Wayne impersonator. I guess he was like the body double for the actual John Wayne. Super old guy, but it was an estate sale. So RIP. Anyways, so he had the coolest stuff and I got to, I bought one of his hats. Yeah. Anyways, back to the story. Okay, so John Wayne Gacy, he was the middle child. He was sandwiched between two sisters and they grew up on the north side of Chicago. Like many of the people we talk about here, John did not have the best childhood, okay? He had, I guess he was born with a heart condition that would prevent him from playing sports or engaging in outdoor activities, which led to him not being very athletic or participating in sports with the other boys, you know, and it led to him just being a little bit overweight when he was growing up. It was said that he was super close with his mom and his sisters, but life with his dad was super rough. His dad was said to be an abusive alcoholic uh, who was physically abusive to his wife and all three of the kids. And John seemed to suffer the most abuse from his father, maybe because he was the only boy, but not good, you know, just not good. Sometimes John's dad would verbally abuse him, uh, but more often than not, it was physical abuse. One of John's earliest memories was being beaten with uh, his father's leather belt after he accidentally messed up some car engine parts his dad had laying out. Like he touched them and he wasn't supposed to and he messed them up and his dad just got pissed. And if his mom stepped in and tried to protect him from his father, John Sr. would call his son a sissy or a mama's boy. And he told his son, you're probably gonna grow up queer. That's what he would say. Super supportive father, as you can tell. Now, John was exposed to like sexual stuff at a really early age. At the age of five, he said that he was fondled or like touched by an older girl. And then in 1949, when John was like six or seven years old, um, he and another boy were caught fondling a young girl. Now, when his dad found out, cause I guess his dad found out, he beat the crap out of John pretty badly which is kind of, you know, whatever. I guess this beating had like a lasting impression on him and he became super terrified of his father after that. Because John was so afraid of his father, it obviously didn't allow open communication to go on between the two of them. And at one point, John was being molested by one of the family friends and he was like just eight years old. And um, this guy, he was a family friend, would take John out for ice cream and then would show him different wrestling holds. I'm using quotes here. So John never said anything because he thought his dad was going to blame him for being molested. And his dad was the kind of person that could always find a reason to beat him up or just to beat on him because um, that's just how he was. Like he really didn't even need a reason to beat up the kids. It does get to one point where John tells his dad that he doesn't want to hang out with the family friend anymore, but he doesn't tell him like what's what's going on exactly, but he just like tells him, I don't want to be alone with him anymore. And then that's it. He doesn't hang out with him. So that's good, I guess, but not, you know, I don't know. You get it. So even though John's upbringing was super rough, he decided to channel his need for acceptance by becoming involved within the community. And at the age of 18, John became an assistant precinct captain for a, a Democratic Party candidate. That was a mouthful for me. And then later on, he would become a precinct captain. For those of you who don't know what the captain does, um, because I didn't, you know, they're essentially elected they are an elected official who act as a direct link between the voters and the political party during local elections. So basically John was responsible for helping the voter registration and also getting absentee ballots, distributing campaign and party information, and then just overall being an active member of outreach. 
basically someone that the community trusted. His dad was not impressed with John's desire to help the community and would refer to him as a pansy. During John's senior year of high school, he ended up dropping out and decided to move to Las Vegas, which this is a side note. Why do people drop out senior year? Like you only have one more year to go and then you're done and then you're done. You are done. But then when, pe when people drop out, I don't, why? Just finish and then you're done. Anytime you need life advice, you're welcome. Anyway, so he drops out of school and he goes to Las Vegas. When he gets to Las Vegas, he ends up working for a, a funeral parlor. Now, this is like already in itself very strange because he gets hired at this funeral parlor and they find out that like John doesn't have anywhere to stay. Um, he like moved out there and he's not settled, right? So the owner of this parlor was like, you can live here in the funeral parlor. And they set up a cot for him behind the embalming room, which is like, okay, I don't know that, it, that okay, it's a choice. Creepy place to live full time, but John, I think he was happy just to have a place, who knows. But John just seemed to like it because when he would sleep there in the cot, he'd be in the room, the place alone, right? So at night he would climb into one of the coffins or some of the coffins and cuddle up with the body of someone that was in the coffin. So there was one time that it was a teenage boy who was who had passed and was like in the coffin. So he gets up and he gets in there with them and cuddles. Yeah, so that happened. John was quote unquote, pretty normal. He was an active member in the community. He was outgoing. People seemed to really like him. Like you would never know that something was off, you know? But I think at this point it was the first sign that something was different with him. Yeah. And even John in later interviews said like, it was at this moment that he kind of, it, it, like a light bulb went out off on his head and he was like, okay, what I'm doing is is wrong. Like I'm in here petting a dead body. And then he kind of went into like a state of shock is what he said. Um, it was like a wake up call in a way, um, an awakening, but not like a, an awakening to where he's like, I'm gonna be better. It seemed like it was a dark awakening. He wakes up, he decides, you know what? This Las Vegas thing isn't for me. So, and he calls up his mom and he's like, mom, can I come back home? You know, will dad let me come back home? And she's like, yeah, you know, you can come back home. He forgives you for dropping out of school, moving to Las Vegas, but it's fine, just come home. After being in Vegas for only three months, John moves back home to Chicago with his parents. So when John moves back home, he then attends business college and then he ends up graduating in 1963. And then John gets a, a job working at a shoe company that asks him to relocate to Springfield, Illinois, where he then is working as a salesman. So once again, when John moved, this is when he decided to get um, active in the community again, but this time in Springfield. So he joined a local nonprofit leadership training organization that focuses on business development, management skills, and also community service. And it's, um, it's called the JC organization. And John must have like really loved working with them because he busted his ass and he spent a lot of time with them. After spending so much time with them, he ends up becoming the vice president of the organization in 1965. And he was named the third most outstanding JC in the state of Illinois. He's number three, he's number three, you know, wow. During this time is when he meets a coworker named Marilyn Myers and they start dating. And then after dating for a little bit of time, they get engaged, ooh. So six months after they were engaged, they got married. Um, but during that time, Johnny Boy was not exactly faithful to Miss Marilyn. He tells Marilyn that one night, or she finds out, somehow she finds out. But one night he gets really drunk and then he gets a blowy from one of the fellow JC members. Babe, babe, I didn't even touch her. She touched me with her mouth. I didn't cheat, she did it. But I mean, she ends up working through it with him and John and Marilyn proceed to still get married. So we're not judging because you know, we're judging kind of, but not really. But, uh. 
So the two of them get married and John's new father-in-law, he happened to purchase three different KFC restaurants in Waterloo, Iowa. KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, you know, hell yeah. So he purchases three of those and he goes to John and he's like, hey, like, would you like to be a manager of my three restaurants? I need a manager. And John is like, hell yeah, like this is a very great opportunity. Very secure job, great money. So Marilyn and John, they pick up and they move to Waterloo. John would later describe his time in Waterloo as being perfect because it was just a great job, a perfect marriage, according to him. Uh, Marilyn gave birth to their son in February of 1966 and then their daughter in the March, in March of the following year. And John was just working his butt off at these KFC restaurants and he was also active at the local JC chapter. And again, it wasn't long before he became vice president of the Waterloo JCs. The people at the JC meetings, they like loved John because he would bring in um, Kentucky Fried Chicken to all the meetings and he insisted everybody call him the Colonel. I don't know. I guess he just liked when people liked him. Anyway, so top it all off, when his parents came to visit him in 1966, his father, was actually proud of him. And he pulls John aside and like apologizes to him for all the physical and emotional abuse he inflicted on him when John was younger. And John Sr. even went so far as to telling John like, I was wrong about you. And then he shook his hand. And like that to John was a groundbreaking moment. His dad was proud of him. I mean, he finally got his father's approval, something he could never get. And yeah, it just had a very uh, big effect on him. But not everything during these perfect years were indeed perfect, of course not. John and the other members of the Waterloo JC were heavily involved with drugs, porn, picking up sex workers, and wife swapping. Mm hmm. It seemed like a bit of a, like a party organization, which that's fine, I guess. Um, but wife swapping, not the show, like um, kind of like, it's like a swingers party, it seems like. Um, and that's not all, like John had opened up a quote unquote club in the basement of his house where all of the employees or a lot of the employees from his KFC restaurants would come over, kick it, drink, play pool and they would do this until like the in to the late of the night. A lot of the employees like loved him because he's this cool manager who lets them come over and just party all night and hang out and drink. And they're like, hey, this is cool. So from the looks of it, this whole like downstairs party club thing, it just it seemed all fun, like a manager who's taking care of his employees. But really it was just a way for John to indulge himself because both um, boys and girls would come over and hang at this little club, but John would spend most of his time hanging out with the younger boys, the teenage boys that were working at the KFCs. Um, and then he would give these teenage teenagers like a bunch of alcohol. And of course, like not of course, but you know, when you're a teenager and like an adult gives you alcohol and you're hanging out and with friends, like you're probably gonna drink it and you're probably gonna be like, well, this is so cool. Then after kind of gaining their trust and giving them alcohol and being the cool manager, then John would make sexual advances once he got the kids uh, sauced up a little bit if the guy or the teenager or the boy was like, hold on, like, I'm not into that, John would laugh it off <laughs> and just say like, I'm just joking, LOL, just testing your morals, you know, just LOL, LOL, that's all. Starting in August of 1967, John starts getting into a bit more trouble. Mm. Hmm. John invited the 15 year old son of one of his fellow JC members over. He's like, come on over to the house, we'll hang out. I have a pool table. So John invites Donald over, gives him some alcohol, lets him watch porn. And then casually John's like, you know, you have to have sex with a man before you can start having sex with women. Did you know that? And this 15 year old didn't know any better. So he thinks that that is indeed a thing. I mean, he's trusting this older man, poor thing, but he ends up going along with it. 
Sadly, Donald was not John's only victim at this time. John had assaulted a number of other teens. He tricked a couple of them into believing he needed them to participate in what he called homosexual experiments for scientific research. And in exchange, he was gonna give them a payment of $50 which wasn't bad. Well, I mean, it is bad, it is bad, but like in today's money, that would be equivalent to $400. So that's like a lot of money for the scientist, scientific research. And when you're a teenager, you know, it's just scummy, scummy scientific research. He works at KFC. What kind of science are they doing there? So while Donald was not the only one, he was the only one who spoke up. So after this, um, after this happens, Donald goes to his dad, tells his dad what happened, and for obvious reasons, his father was livid, livid. So immediately, he told the cops what had happened, and John was arrested and charged with oral sodomy. Mm hmm. Now, John denied, 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 uh, because it came out like publicly. So he was like, I didn't, he's just denying, right? Because he needs to maintain this good image. Denied, denied, denied. He was claiming publicly that Donald's father was doing this for like political reasons. And to prove his innocence, John was like, I demand I be given a polygraph test. Like I'll prove to you guys that I'm not lying. So they take him up on the, his offer. They're like, okay, let's do the polygraph test. And John's like, shit, you know, like, oh fuck. Okay. So they go along with it. They hook John up to give him the polygraph test, right? And they ask him like, hey, did you have sex with uh, this boy? And John says, no, I did not. But the lie detector test determined that was a lie. He failed. And because of this, not because of this, because of his actions, John was indicted on the sodomy charges on May 10th, 1968, as he should be. So obviously, John is not very happy. He's not very pleased with um, Donald going around saying, making these wild accusations that he did something that he definitely did, but he didn't want him to say it, you know? So John is like, I need to stop Donald from testifying and then everything will get dropped. So on August 30th, John decides to hire uh, one of his employees to approach Donald and rough him up a little bit in order to convince him not to testify. In other words, scare him or beat him up so he wouldn't testify. Now, Donald was approached by these aggressors and luckily he was able to escape. So at first the employee denied, 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 denied. He's like, I ain't doing anything with me. But then eventually, like it didn't even take that long before this employee just threw John under the bus. And he's like, well, actually John hired me to beat him up. So because of this, John was once again arrested and he was given an additional charge for trying to intimidate a witness. Not long after that, John was ordered to submit a psychological evaluation and doctors end up uh, diagnosing John with antisocial personality disorder, but they also determined that he is fit to stand trial. They do warn the judge that John most likely wouldn't benefit from therapy or treatment and he would probably commit assault again. This is what they, they tell the judge. He's probably gonna do something again and nothing's gonna save him essentially. And honestly, somebody should have listened. Somebody should have maybe listened to him, but they didn't. Of course they didn't. Why would they do their job? We don't know. During his trial, which was on November 7th, 1968, John pleaded guilty to the charge of sodomy against Donald, but claimed that Donald had actually propositioned him, not the other way around. No one believed his story and he ended up being convicted on December 3rd and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. I wish I could tell you that was the end. The end, you know? Of course not. So I guess you could say things are pretty bad for John. And then they go from bad to worse because that same day, Marilyn petitioned for a divorce with sole custody of their two children. And the, the judge had granted her the divorce and John never saw her or the, his two kids again, ever, ever again. So um, I think most of us would consider going to prison, getting divorced and like losing custody of your kids would probably be rock bottom, right? You'd think, oh, it's over, baby. But not for Johnny boy over here. He was making the most of his life in prison. As much as we hate him, 
Everybody said this man had drive, ambition, charm, okay? And because of this little trifecta of a personality or whatever, it really didn't take John long before he was given the position of head cook in the prison. And he found a way to increase his, the daily pay for the inmates who worked in the, the mess hall. He like represented the people. He also joined the JC chapter of inmates and he actually increased their membership by adding or bringing in 600 people in a little over a year. Yeah, so this guy, I mean, he just makes moves. He makes moves. And then on top of all of that, he found ways to improve the conditions at the prison. So he, um, one thing that he did was he got them to install a mini golf course in the, in the rec yard, right? He was good with his words or something. It's a shame John was such a shithead. Like he seemed like he could really make things happen for whatever community he was living in. That's a damn shame, you know? After serving 18 months of his 10 year sentence, John was granted parole and he was only given a one year probation period. 18 months. Ugh. All because of his great behavior. Model prison inmate. Isn't that just terrifying? I just feel like they probably shouldn't have done that. But they did. Choices were once again made. John swore up and down that he was a new man. He changed. He was never going back to that old John. Changed man. Great, right? Great, we're rooting for you, you're changed. Do good things. He moved back to Chicago and he got a job as a cook in a restaurant. But as we all know, tigers can't change their stripes. It didn't take him that long. It was less than a year. John was like, mm, I'm bored. And he was up to his old tricks. Stupid, stupid man. So again, under a year later, once again, John was charged with sexually assaulting a teenage boy on at least two more occasions. In both cases, the charges ended up being dropped and uh, John was free to go. I don't know, You, it's like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Now, ugh, this is where it gets confusing because the, the Iowa Parole Board, they didn't learn about any of this, his arrests and stuff until eight months later after John's parole had already ended. So a month later, John's Previous criminal convictions were sealed, allowing him a fresh start once again. You're probably wondering why, why Bailey? Why, I don't get it. I don't freaking know. I don't make these stupid ass laws. Don't you think they should be held accountable for what happens next because they let his ass go? They had numerous chances to arrest him and hold him and okay, so. Great, John's like, yay, it works out for me every time. That's what I imagine he's saying. He's out of prison and he's like, okay, now I need help moving into an, a home, right? So he asked his mom for some help buying a house in Cook County, Chicago, and they move in together. So they're, you know, roommates. And he starts a part-time construction business and he's working on construction contracts in the evening while working as a cook during the day. And eventually his construction business expands into interior design and remodeling. I know, and because of this, it allows him to quit being a cook and run his business full time. And let me tell you, his business was thriving. He was quite the interior designer. Kind of surprised that Ed Gein was an interior designer. Okay, so just like in Iowa and just like in prison, John becomes once again, super active in his local community. He assists his new neighbors by loaning them tools for any of like their home, DIY projects, that's my DIY move. Um, he also even uh, offers to plow the snow for his neighbors for free. They're like, wow, John, we love this guy. And then during the summer, it was said that John held like the most epic backyard barbecues, okay? Sometimes the guest list to his party were as long as like 400 people. So it wasn't even a backyard barbecue, it was like a block party. And it was said that John just knew how to throw a really good party. At this point, John was also introduced to another club that really piqued his interest. It's called the Jolly Joker Clown Club. And they would volunteer at parades. 
fundraising events, children's hospitals, and people would dress up as clowns and go and make people happy by being a clown, you know? So John uh, gets into this and he creates two different clown characters for his events that he attends. One of the clown characters was named Pogo the Clown and the other was Patches the Clown. Now John would say that Pogo the Clown, he was more fun. He was more fun, he was like, yeah. And then Patches was a little bit more serious. He was like a serious clown. It just depended on his mood, who he wanted to be that day. Years later, during a conversation with detectives when John was under surveillance, um, he actually talked about his volunteer work as a clown and then like casually says, uh, clowns can get away with murder. I mean, if that's not foreshadowing, I don't know what is. I just feel like most people are scared of clowns, but maybe not at this time, people weren't scared yet. I don't know. Clowns are so scary. So John's life is really looking up, right? He's got this fresh start. He's got this house with his mom. He's partying, he's back in the organizations, he's volunteering, and he also got a fresh start on his love life as well. He ended up reconnecting with an ex-girlfriend from his high school, and her name was Carol. And at this point, she already had two daughters, but um, John was like, you know, why don't you move in with me and, and you could bring your two daughters, great. So she did. So. She and her two daughters move in with John and then they get engaged pretty quickly and then they get married on July 1st, 1972. So the marriage just wouldn't last that long, okay? So about three years after they got married, John just out of the blue tells Carol one day, I just wanna let you know that I'm bisexual. Not really sure how she reacted to that, um, but she did, she stayed, maybe she's supportive. But on Mother's Day of that year, John gave her a pretty shitty gift to say the least. Um, so the two of them engage in sexual relations. And then after having sex with Carol, John tells Carol like, oh, by the way, this is the last time we're having sex ever. And Carol's like, um, what? Like, what does that mean? What do you mean, huh? Like, I've got follow-up questions. And he really didn't explain at all as to why this is the case. She was confused, but she also thought maybe it's just a phase, right? Maybe he doesn't mean it. What does he even mean? Okay, I guess, I don't know. But after that moment, that's when Carol notices like just the relationship started really going downhill. John was working really late nights he wouldn't come home until like crazy hours in the morning. And then one day while he was gone, Carol was like, let me snoop around John's stuff and like see if there's anything going on, you know? So she starts snooping around in his little man cave area and she comes across a bunch of gay porn and she also finds a few different men's wallets in the house. She didn't really know what to make of that, but it's like, hmm. Weird. When John did come home, it was super odd because he wouldn't even really acknowledge Carol. The relationship was shit. And he would just head straight to the garage with a bunch of like teen boys that he worked with at KFC, you know? And he always had like a posse of, of younger boys with him hanging by his side. And they would hang in his little man cave until late into the night. Now, eventually Carol asked John like, what is this all about? Like, what is going on? What is going on? What is happening? What is this? And I guess this really made John upset. And he just tells Carol, like, you better shut the F up. You know, it's really none of your business what I'm doing. Which is like, yeah, it kind of is because that's your wifey. Okay, so him and his wife are just kind of bickering, not getting along, obviously. And this went on for about five months. And then finally, like the last straw for the relationship was a pretty intense fight they had over balancing the checkbook. I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, at least she got out, okay? So Carol asked for a divorce, John agrees, right? And Carol and her daughters, they end up staying in the house um, for like another four months, just until the divorce is finalized. So John's construction business, they employed a lot of high school students. A lot of young men is what I'm getting at. And the reason was because 
for one, John liked it, obviously, at, but for the construction um, crew, they wanted someone who like was fit and could handle harder labor. That's why they hired the younger boys. But during this time, John was using his own work Rolodex as means to like hook up with men. He would even like test the waters to see if certain employees were down for sex or at least sexual favors in exchange for extra money. Um, sometimes he would offer young men to borrow his car. And um, sometimes he would be like, hey, if you have sex with me, I'll give you a promotion. And if they were not willing participants, right off the bat, John was known for telling them that he had a gun and he would threaten to kill them if they didn't comply. So there were a couple of other employees that gave John a more challenging time when it came to like trying to have a good time. But the biggest one was in 1976 when John had an incident with an 18 year old um, named David. So John met David while David was hitchhiking. So um, he picks David up and they were driving to wherever it was they were going and the two of them get to talking, right? And John learns that David, he has nowhere to go. He has no job. And John's like, great, you know, I have spare rooms at my house and I own a construction company. So John offers David um, a job at his construction company and he also offers David to move in with him as well. I mean, he's got the space now because Carol and the girls, they all moved out. He's like, the house is kind of quiet. There's plenty of space, you know, I'm just being nice. David's like, cool, thanks. I mean, he takes him up on this. Unfortunately, John can't seem to keep it in his pants for too long because that very night, he learns that, uh, he learns that it's, it's David's birthday and he's turning 19 years old. So John learns it's his birthday and he's like, hey, we should celebrate, you're 19. We're alone in my house, you know? So they're drinking, they're celebrating, and then John's like, everybody loves a birthday clown. Oh God. So John decides to dress up in his pogo clown outfit. Um, he's like, I just wanna make it more like a birthday celebration. So he does that and he's like, everyone loves a clown at a party, right? So I guess it was all fun and games, whatever. And then John dressed as the clown he somehow uh, cons David into putting on a pair of handcuffs. He's like, let me show you this trick. And he gets David to put his hands in front of him and then handcuffs him. And then I guess at that very instant, that's when like the mood changes. John grabs the chain of the handcuffs and like swings David around and just straight up tells him, I am going to rape you. And David was like, fuck. No, you are not. So he fights back. He ends up kicking John in the face and manages to get himself free. From what I've read, John was a pretty convincing guy. He was a good talker, wasn't he? I don't know, but he ends up somehow convincing David that like, oh, this was just a joke gone wrong. No, I was just, I was just joking. And I don't know, he's just able to, talk his way out of it, convinces David that it's all okay. And he's like, you don't have to move out. You could stay here. It's like, it, it won't happen again. So David continues to stay with John. So whatever he said, it, it just, yeah, you get it. It worked, I guess. It wasn't long though until John tried to rape David again. This time he did it in a way more threatening way. Maybe it was the lack of clown costume or the fact that he said, quote, Dave, you really don't know who I am. Maybe it would be good if you give me what I want. It was a quote, end quote. Once again, David is somehow able to hold John off. John gets extremely frustrated and eventually just gives up. Um, as he's leaving, John tells David like, you are not any fun. And then after this incident, David finally decides to move out. He would still continue to do work for John here and there over the next two years, but he really just tried to stay away. So around this time, John actually decides to up his game and go further than just assaulting these boys, okay? He's ready to take it to the next level. There were a number of young men and boys who were wrapped up in um, a night of drinking, with John at his house and uh, maybe even doing some drugs when John would bust out his handcuffs and tell them like, hey, do you guys wanna see a magic trick with my handcuffs? He would handcuff himself 
to like show everyone that they're magic handcuffs. But he would he would um he would handcuff himself behind his back and then magically escape. But really, John just had the key hidden in his hand and he was able to get out of the handcuffs. So there was no magic, okay? So once he showed them this trick, he's like, do you guys wanna learn how to do this trick? I could teach you. And the one of the kids would be like, yeah, like show me, I wanna learn how to escape from handcuffs. So John puts the handcuffs on um, an, a kid who's there. And he's like, I'm gonna show you how to get out of this, right? Once the handcuffs are on, John would then reveal his secret to escaping this magic trick was by having a key. That's the trick. While his victims were handcuffed, John would often take advantage of these men and boys by raping them or often just straight up torturing them. Like sick torture, abuse, awful, ugh, just all bad. It was real bad. So finally, John would show his victims the finale a tr another trick he had. This one was called the rope trick. And the rope trick was essentially John tying a rope around their neck and then strangling them to death. It was no trick, it, he was murdering them, yeah. And um, as John was performing this trick on different victims, he seemed to get like progressively more and more aggressive. Some of them he would just strangle with the rope, which is still awful, not trying to say it's not. Some of the victims he would shove underwear deep into the victim's throat, which would lead to them dying from um, asphyxiation before the rope trick came to play. So yeah, it was a lot, it was a lot. So it went from John just um, sexually abusing and raping boys to now full-blown murder. He was, he see, yep, he was loving it or something. So when John's victims were finally dead, John would often hide the body under his bed for like a full day. And then he was like, okay, I should probably move them somewhere. So then he decided it'd be best to move them under the crawl space under his house, crawl space. Some of the bodies he treated with quicklime um, every once in a while to kind of move the decomposition process along just a little faster. And then on other victims, he would try to embalm them. It's unclear like who got what treatment and why. I, I think he was just kind of playing around. I don't know, I don't know. This dude was just hella sick. Honestly, John didn't really seem that picky about who his victims were, as long as they were young and they were boys, young men, young gentlemen. Sometimes he knew them, um, sometimes they were like just random strangers he would see at a bus stop or maybe hitchhiking or just walking along the street. There were also a number of ways John trapped his victims. Some of them, it seemed like most of them, he promised them a job working for his construction company. I mean, cause he had this company. So it was kind of like, hey, I could give you a job. You get it. Yeah. So he was like, I could give you a job. Of course, a lot of them were gonna say, yeah. And then other times it was like, hey, you should come back to my place. I have alcohol, drugs. I could give you sex in exchange for money or you can give me sex in exchange for money. And, uh, that was just like ways he got the victims to go back to his house. Now, the scariest thing of all was there was one point where John was able to get his hands on a police badge, whether it was fake or not, he was just able to get his hands on a police badge and like a little siren light that he would put on his car. And he would trick victims into believing that he was a police officer. That is super fucked up. That's scary. <laughs> Now, mind you, all of this could have been prevented because he was in prison and he was sentenced to 10 years and he should have been there for 10 years, but instead he was released. And even after that, he got just way too many chances. Stupid, stupid man. John had been pulling these stunts since 1972 and he was getting away with it for a pretty damn long time. So you know how he was married to the second wife, wife number two. Um, now there was a lot of debate. There's a lot of question like how much did she know? Did she know anything at all? How could she not know? And it was believed that in certain cases that she may actually have known what was going on or that John had forced her into staying silent about his crimes. And many believe that she may have been a forced accomplice. Um, but there's great debate on that one. 
So also, many people have wondered throughout the years, like, why didn't the local police notice anything going on? I mean, there was like a bunch of people going missing. Um, like, how come no one saw nothing? Nobody questioned anything. No one reported these people missing. Like, it's just bizarre. Um, now, cops said that they saw plenty of young men going in and out of John's house over the years. But none of these guys, at least the ones that were able to leave, came out and like said anything against John. Um, I'm assuming here that they were probably either threatened, maybe embarrassed, scared, or maybe they didn't get, I doubt they didn't get something from John. But you know, there's many reasons as to why people don't speak out, but that may be why nothing was said. But it's just bizarre that like all these people are going missing and it's just weird. I don't know. One source had said that the police believed these victims were just runaways. And then another said that the police didn't want to do anything because it seemed to be like homosexual stuff and they didn't want to touch it. Once again, the police not doing their goddamn job. John's first known murder victim was a 16 year old kid named Timothy. And on January 2nd, 1972, John was at a family party and I guess he's hanging out and he tells the people, his family, that he's gonna leave. He's gonna go for a drive because um, they put up some local ice sculptures and they're on display and it only happens every once in a while. So he's like, I'm gonna go see the ice sculptures. So he gets in his car, he drives away. And while he's driving around, that's when he, see, he sees young Timothy at the Chicago bus terminal. And it was late at night. So he was like, hey kid, like it's super late. I have a home you could stay at. Like I'll give you a place to sleep tonight, bring you back in the morning to catch the, the next bus. You shouldn't be out here, it's dangerous. Timothy's like, you know, that sounds great. Sure. So he gets in the car with John and they drive around. John, I guess, drives him around like the city. Maybe he takes him to the ice sculptures, I don't know. But then eventually they head back to his place. Now the details on this story are really unclear, but here's what John said, who I'm sure is not a very reliable source. I'm sure we can all agree on that. So the boy sleeps over. John says he wakes up the next morning from bed. This is him waking up. And he sees Timothy, the boy, he's standing in John's bedroom doorway and he's holding a knife from his kitchen. Like there's a knife in his hand. Now John says he just reacts. Okay, he reacts, he jumps up. Timothy was like, I guess he didn't say anything, but he was looking like he was trying to surrender and he accidentally cut John's arm. And I guess that really set John off. So he grabs, again, Timothy hasn't said anything and this is according to John. So John grabs Timothy's wrist and he twists it so the kid would drop the knife. And then he slams the kid's head into the wall and then he kicks him like into the closet. So then this young boy, Timothy, he fights back. He kicks John square in the stomach and the two of them are like wrestling on the floor. And eventually John is able to get on top of him and then just starts stabbing him in the chest. Bizarre, weird tragic, I don't know. So John just leaves Timothy to die on the floor. And he said he gets up, he goes to the kitchen to put the knife back. And that's when he notices like there was an open carton of eggs and some bacon on the count on the counter and the kitchen table was set. And John's like, oh, I think Timothy was like, just coming to ask how I like my eggs cooked. Whoopsie. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm laughing because of just like, I don't, I don't, uh, okay, okay, this, okay. So this whole thing, John would say in later interviews that this whole situation, this experience, it gave him a mind numbing orgasm and he just was very sexually satisfied from what just happened. Yeah. And that's the moment John said he realized that death was the ultimate thrill for him. So he's like, you know what? I really worked up an appetite. He eats the meal that poor Timothy was uh, making for them. 
And then once he's all done, he gets Timothy and puts him in the crawl space under his house. And then later on, he goes back and covers the area with like a, an additional layer of concrete. So after killing Timothy, I guess this like satisfied John for quite some time because he waited about two years before he killed again. And as time went on, John started to be less cautious and started to get on the police's radar a bit. You see, in January 1976, Chicago police suspected John was responsible for the disappearance of a nine-year-old boy. The problem that they found themselves in was the fact that John lived near the O'Hare Airport, which technically was outside of their jurisdiction, which means like they're not allowed to build a case against him. It would have to be the other police department. So you're probably wondering, why didn't they just call up the other police department and be like, hey, there's this real, there's a suspicious guy over here. Let me tell you about him. He's doing some shit. You, should, you need to get on it. There were a couple of uh, victims who were able to get away or rather for some reason, John decided to let them live. In March of 1977, a 27 year old, his name was Jeff. He was lured into John's car where then John chloroformed him and then brutally raped and beat him. Unfortunately, cops didn't take his case very seriously. So Jeff made it his life's mission to track down who this person was who attacked him because he had like no memory of it. So he's going around searching the city for like a month and he recognizes this victim, Jeff. He recognizes John's car. He's like, that's fucking him. He writes on the license plate and then he goes to police and gives them the number. Like this guy chloroformed me, he could rape me, beat me. Like you need to go get him. So, uh, uh, Jeff ends up filing a civil lawsuit against John and Jeff claimed that John offered him weed, but instead he used chloroform to knock him out. And when he woke up, he was handcuffed in John's house and then John sexually attacked him before he let Jeff go. Once again, the man who's been getting far too many chances, John was charged with battery, yeah which is a misdemeanor, which means he had to pay $3,000 and that was it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know. I don't know. Sick, sick. And you know what's worse? They had him, John. John. They had him in court and stuff. They could have like, they, why, didn't they, why didn't they search his house or something? I don't know. Anyways, so Jeff would actually go on later in life. He would write a book about his experience. It's called 29 Below. Poor guy, I hope he's okay. Then there was another victim who was a 19 year old that John had kidnapped at gunpoint and forced this young man to do sexual stuff, raped him. And when he was taken into custody, John admitted that he engaged with some sexual behavior with this guy. Um, and he admitted to the police that the sexual acts were pretty brutal, they were intense, but he said that the participant was, it was consensual. He consented to everything. That's what John told police. In fact, this kid was actually his consensual sex slave, according to John. Now the police, for some sick reason, believed John and the assistant state, state's attorney, they decided not to prosecute. I know, shouldn't they, that all of them just be fired? Just that whole state of people in charge fired. Well, they're probably not there anymore, but what a crock of shit. Outside of John being absolutely psycho, he was considered, I mean, people looked at him like a pretty normal guy. Like he was very active in the community still. He was even appointed the director position for Chicago's annual Polish Constitution Day Parade. <laughs> yes. So with this position that he got, it gave him the opportunity to take a photo with the first lady 
uh, Rosalind Carter. So he gets a picture with the president's wife on May 6, 1978. Now, the funny thing is, now this is not funny, but the funny thing is, in order to get a picture with Miss um, Carter, the Secret Service, they had to do a background check on anybody who like takes a picture with her, meets her to make sure, you know, they're not killers, whatever. They need to give them special clearance, which if you're like me, you're thinking, oh, right. So the Secret Service, beep, bop, boop, they're gonna pull up John's background and be like, LOL, JK, no picture for you, you know? But I mean, cause that makes sense. Well, if the world made sense, that probably would have happened, but the Secret Service did a background check on John and they ended up clearing him. He was A-OK, -okay. cleared background. So he was approved. Okay, great. They're like, great. You get to meet the first lady, snag a photo. Now it's like, the thing is, that's just a bad look for the freaking president too. I mean, cause when all shit hits the fan, all the information comes out, it's like, here she is photographed with the president's wife. Ugh. Does anyone do their jobs around here? Or are we all just like too busy doing not that? So by 1978, John's crawl space under his house where he was hiding bodies was absolutely maxed out. He couldn't fit any more bodies under the house. So he was like, you know, I could put bodies up in the attic, you know, that's an option. But he realized that it's a terrible option because the bodies would probably leak um, when they decomposed and then it would come through the ceilings and just be a big old mess. So instead, John decided it would be best if maybe he stopped using his house as a graveyard. So instead he started to throw them into the local river, Des Plaines River. And he would end up doing this five different times. On December 11th, 1978 at 9 p.m., there was a 15 year old high school student named Robert who was finishing up his shift at the local pharmacy. So he's working there at the local pharmacy, you get it. His mom comes to pick him up, right? She comes to pick up Robert, she's gonna take him home. And they're excited because it's actually his mom's birthday. It's her 46th birthday. And they have plans to just celebrate with the whole family, have some cake, whatever. So she's waiting for him and her son, Robert, runs out of the pharmacy and runs to the car and is like, hey mom, can you wait a few minutes? Um, there's this guy who offered me a construction job that pays $5 an hour and it would be awesome to make that kind of money. Cause it was like twice what he was making at his current job. So, his mom is like, sure, like, go ahead, honey. I'll wait right here. And she's just waiting outside for Robert to come back. Well, some time passes by and Robert doesn't come back. So she's like, dude, where is he, you know? So she's getting a little nervous. She looks around for him. She's not seeing him. Uh, so his mom drives home and she tells her husband, okay, Robert was there one minute and now he's just missing. So the whole family, it's Robert's mom and dad, their, his two siblings and their two dogs, they all pile into the family car, head back to the local pharmacy and they look for Robert. Now they're searching for quite some time and they can't find any clues, nothing. He just poof vanished. Finally, it got late into the night. It was like 1130 at night. Robert's mom decides to go to the police and file a missing persons report thing, it was her birthday. Now this case, it would hit close to home for a new police lieutenant that was working there that night um, because his son was attending the same high school as Robert and he was, he just resonated with this, this woman and her missing son, you know, he's afraid that his own son might be at risk of a similar fate. So the Lieutenant insists on taking this case on himself. He's determined to find answers. Okay. He's not just going to write it down as missing. He's going to do something about it. And at this point, he was only the chief of detectives for about six months. So many uh, were saying like, oh, he probably had something to prove, which is so annoying. Maybe he was doing his damn job. You wish every police officer would react like this guy. So, um, okay, this Lieutenant asked, you know, when was the last time you saw him, right? And he discovers that John Wayne Gacy, he was one of the contractors who recently helped remodel the pharmacy that Robert was working at. So he thought to himself, like maybe John was the contractor Robert was talking to about that potential job. Like that kind of makes sense, right? So the Lieutenant calls um, up John 
and leaves a message asking like, hey, can you come into the station for questioning? Just wanna talk. Then at 11 p.m. on December 12th, John calls up the lieutenant and asks like, hey, do you still wanna to talk to me? And the lieutenant's like, yeah, can you get here today? Or how long do you think it'll take you to get here? Like, I'll be, I'll be here. And John's like, I'll be there in a half an hour. So the lieutenant's like, great, can't wait. Well, time goes by and then it's like a 1 a.m. and John is still a no-show. So he's like, great. But you know what? John was actually super busy at that time because when John had called up the lieutenant, he actually was in the middle of something. He was in the middle of taking Robert's body and trying to get rid of it. So he, he's on the phone with the lieutenant, click, right? So he ends up loading Robert's body into the trunk of his car and then he drives south so he can dump the body in the river. So John drops the body off and he's now driving to go talk to the lieutenant. And I guess uh, he must have hit like a patch of ice or something because his truck spun out and it was like 2 a.m. and John's car was getting towed out of a snowbank. So then once everything's all settled, <laughs> at 3 a.m. covered in mud, John walks into the police station. He's like, hey, I'm here to meet with the lieutenant. And whoever I was at the main desk is like, it's three in the morning. Why don't you come back later? And, um, you know, he didn't have to, he didn't have to come back, right? He could have just ran for it. But you know what? John being that outstanding citizen he is, he, um, he comes back the next day. So John comes back and gives his brief statement to the lieutenant. And honestly, the lieutenant's getting weird, weird vibes from John. And he's thinking John is holding Robert hostage in his house. So he asked for, for the keys to John's house. Now, John was a little hesitant to give over his keys for obvious reasons, but he, um, he eventually hands over his keys. He's like, yeah, you could search my house and they do. So the cops, they hold John in custody while they search his home. So the cops end up going to John's home and they do search his house and they don't really find much. And by not finding much, I mean, they, they aren't really finding any evidence as to like what may have happened to Robert. But what they do find is plenty of gay porn, some needles, a starter pistol, some rope, and an 18 inch dildo, oh, and the handcuffs. You know, mm, okay. None of this is illegal to own, but the lieutenant's kind of frustrated because he just has this feeling that John, it's fucking John, like John knows something, but he fears that this is a dead end. Um, so they keep looking around, keep looking, and then they come across a receipt. And on the receipt, they find a charge for um, film that was being developed at the pharmacy where Ro Robert worked. This seems to be enough evidence to convince the cops to seize John's car, van, and pickup truck um, to be searched later, hoping that one of the vehicles will at, will at least have some kind of clue in it. So they have the car searched and they find some fibers that could possibly be hair, but it's not super conclusive. They also have one of those trained dogs come and sniff around the cars to see if like they could smell Robert um, or uh, death. You know how some of the dogs can smell death? Dogs are magical. So they have the dog come and the dog searching one of the, the cars and the dog lays down on the passenger seat of the car and the dog handler is like, oh, that's his reaction to death. That's his death reaction. And it was believed that Robert's body had probably been in there at some point, but they have all this information, but it doesn't mean anything. Like there's no hard evidence that turns up to prove that uh, Robert is linked to John. Police take some stuff from John's house, but nothing the police confiscated could connect John to Robert's disappearance. So at 11 p.m. that night, John was released from, from prison because they had nothing on him, you know? One day later on December 15th, um, one of the items police seized during the search of his home, it comes back with a positive ID, but it's not a positive ID to Robert. It's actually, um, it belongs to a high school kid. It was his class ring, and this kid had been missing for two years. Why does John have it? And not only that, when one of John's employees were questioned, one of them tells police that some former employees just had disappeared. Like, they don't know what happened. They were here one day and then gone the next. 
Granny says Spesh. I'm sure we can all agree. John's got the class ring of a kid who disappeared a couple of years ago and some of his employees have gone missing. Great, just what we need. Now, that same day, John calls up the police and invites them over for breakfast. Not sure why, but it was rumored that one of them was totally John's type and he had a bit of a crush on him. The cops noticed that John, he's not looking too good. He's looking a little tired, anxious. Hmm, maybe something's wearing on him a little bit, huh? But that's not all the police notice. When they're over at John's house, one of them said instantly when they walked in, they could smell death, which sounds gross, you know? Uh, but they say death has a certain smell and the police officer is like, I smell it, like what is that smell? And he brings it up to John and John's like, oh yeah, I have mold, it's mold. Oh, and I got some rodents over there. So it's just stinky, no big deal. So I guess the smell of John's house really wasn't enough for police to search his home again, right? Like you think it would be, but it's not. Instead, John got a lawyer, he lawyered up, and John's lawyer actually filed a $750,000 lawsuit against the city and the police department. His lawyer was saying that the police were harassing John and doing illegal searches, and they were also just, taking stuff that they weren't allowed to, plus they were destroying poor John's reputation in the whole process. Hmm. So they were not allowed to search his home again. What a freaking mess, right? But luckily, luckily, finally, police, they really didn't have to wait that much longer because on December 21st, 1978, John was followed to a gas station, okay? The cops were following him and they saw him pass off like a package to one of the clerk workers at the gas station. The package was seized. It had a bunch of weed in there. And this was great because it's like what they needed to finally arrest John for something, right? They just wanted to hold him so they could further search his house. So they're like, yippee skippy, we got him. Yes, he gets arrested. Meanwhile, the day before John is arrested for the weed situation, he actually goes to visit his lawyer. And his lawyer wants to discuss that civil lawsuit they're filing, the 750,000. So he's like, come on over, we're gonna talk about it, whatever. So when John gets there, instead of talking about the civil lawsuit, John sees like the local newspaper on his lawyer's desk and he reads like the head story. It's about that kid who went missing and he was, his name's Robert. And John, I guess, looks at it and the first thing he says is, he's dead, he's in a river. And just like that, it was over, baby. I guess John sat there for hours confessing everything to his lawyer, saying that he had killed 32 men after having sexual relations with them. 32 men, that's a lot, 32? So while he's confessing, it was said to be strange and unusual because John was talking in the third person. He also was making it sound like he had an accomplice. I mean, his lawyer noticed that John literally had like no emotions towards any of the victims. And it was like, just, he just was going into great detail and just nothing, just nothing. You know, it was hard to keep up. But um, during his confession, John goes into great detail about burying bodies under his house and also that he was using the river to dump bodies there. It was said that John, while he was confessing, he like fell asleep in the middle of his confession. I guess he was bored. But his lawyer said that he was in absolute shock and while John was taking his little nap, he's trying to come up with a plan because that's his job, right? So John's taking a nap. The lawyer's like, okay, we're gonna get him a psychiatric evaluation and maybe kind of lean into that, right? His lawyer wakes John up from his nap. He's like, hey, we're gonna do a psychiatric evaluation. But instead John, he brushes him off. He says he doesn't, he's got things to do. He's like, no, I got things to do. And then that's when he gets up to leave and he goes to the gas station to deliver the weed where then he gets arrested. 
So John's arrested once again. And during this time, the police get another warrant to search his home. They also interview one of John's employees and they learn that a while back, John had asked his employee to dig a trench in his crawl space. They asked another employee who said that he helped dig some trenches and spread lime in them. And then he told police that the trenches were pretty small, kind of like the size of a shallow grave. Now there are many speculations, many rumors that these two employees were involved with the murders. They were accomplices, you know, to John. That's a big debate. They say no. They stood by the fact that they had no idea what the trenches were for or what John was up to. Many believe that's untrue, but either way, police got the information they needed from him or them, I should say, and knew like, okay, they must be in these crawl spaces, right? That's where Robert's gonna be at. They didn't even know like to the, what they were getting themselves into. They thought they were just gonna find Robert. Nay, nay. So while police and stuff are searching John's house, they have John being questioned back at the station, right? And they're trying to get a confession out of him. And cops are like, we're gonna tear up the floors of your house. Uh, we'll have to do whatever it takes to find Robert's body. And John's like, like I'm telling you, like Robert isn't there, but you might find other people buried in the floor. And then he goes on to say that there's another guy buried in the floor that uh, I was forced to kill in self-defense. And the police are like, oh God, what? John ends up going back to the house with police and he uses a spray can to kind of mark on the ground where bodies are buried at. So he marks a couple of spaces for the police but while searching the crawl space under John's house, they come across like a trap door. Um, and when they open up this little trap door, they find numerous body parts. I'm talking lots of different body parts, just all skedaddled about. So they've got three in the crawl space and they've got another person under the garage floor. Where are the rest? They don't even know about the rest yet. The next day, December 22nd, John begins talking to police and then he admits to burying 27 bodies around his property. He also confesses to throwing bodies into the river and um, four bodies are eventually found, but Robert's body is never recovered. To help with the search of his house and hoping that they would spare his carpets from destruction, John, um, he ends up drawing a diagram showing the police like where all the bodies are bur buried in the crawl space as well as a few other places around his property that they were all buried. His place must have reeked, 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 reeked. After all this, John is moved to the uh, hospital because they think like there might be more going on with him. And John tried really hard to convince them that he had multiple personality disorder. He claimed that he had four personalities and they had um, three psychiatric experts not work on him, diagnose him um, as a paranoid schizophrenic with multiple personalities. But the prosecution, they believe that he was sane and in full control of his actions that, you know, he be tried as himself. So after searching John's house even more, they don't come across just 27 bodies like John had originally confessed. They end up finding 29 bodies in total and 26 of them were found in the crawl space alone. The hell? So when they get into the crawl space, that's when they, they just realize like it's a freaking hot ass mess. The bodies are dismembered and like just heavily dismembered, like in a really bad shape. And um, investigators said that they went to the local McDonald's, I'm not kidding. They went to the local McDonald's and they asked to borrow a fry basket to help them like sift the soil in hopes to kind of get everybody together. So by the time they had finished, John was now being charged with 33 counts of murder. Dude, that's insane. And they were all like buried in his house. Ugh. What a weirdo. So, okay, arrested, trial is coming up, great. February 6th, 1980. John was being charged with 33 counts of murder and he had technically been convicted of more murders than anyone in American history. 
So that's cool, I guess. I guess he's happy about that one. Now, because John had confessed, it was mainly like the whole purpose of the trial was more about deciding if he was insane or not versus him being guilty or innocent. I uh, know that would determine his sentencing. But after undergoing over 300 hours of different psychological tests, John was deemed fit to stand trial despite trying to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. The trial itself, it lasted about five weeks. People were very interested and it took the jury less than like two hours to find him guilty of 33 murders. John was sentenced to serve 12 death sentences and 21 natural life sentences. The parents and the relatives of John's victims actually start to applaud when they learn that John is going to be executed. I mean, I don't blame them. So John was sentenced to death on March 13th, 1980. Oh my God, was isn't it his birthday? The 14th or something? Isn't that weird? I feel like that happens a lot in these stories. It's like right around their birthday. What's that about? But of course like death row just doesn't happen overnight, you know? So he sat on death row for 14 years. John tried to appeal his sentence and during his death row sitting time, he gave a bunch of interviews, giving out just stupid information, trying to prove that he was actually innocent and um, that he didn't do any of it. He also had a telephone number set up where people could pay to hear his 12 minute recorded statement declaring his innocence and saying that he had an alibi for everything and that he was being wrongly convicted. So annoying. He just, whatever, boo. While he sat his ass in jail, he painted, he wrote letters, he tried to prove to everybody that he was innocent. None of it worked. A lot of fans though, he had a lot of fans. Then his execution day came and guess what he had for his final meal? I don't know why I'm so excited, but I was like, oh, full circle. He had KFC. <laughs> Isn't that kind of a full circle moment? Shortly after midnight on May 11th, 1994, John, who was 52 years old at this time, he was given a three drug lethal injection and at 12.58 AM, John Wayne Gacy was finally dead, Dunzo. Now, there are actually rumors that John's final words were, quote, kiss my ass. Everyone believes that that's what his final words were. The state attorney who tried the case and who was there said that that wasn't true, but uh, maybe he's just saying that. I don't know, who knows? But uh, everybody thinks he did say that and they kind of just run with it. Kiss my ass. They're like, yeah, he's the fucking rock star. Mm. So annoying. After going through all the victims found under and around John's freaking house, investigators, they still had eight bodies that they could not identify. Regardless, it was really important to everyone involved with the case that they were still given proper funerals, even if no one knew who they were. So they made them different gravestones saying like we remembered and the date that the body was buried. It's really sad. Over time, DNA, you know, became a thing and like they're able to um, ID people based off DNA evidence. So two of the victims, actually, they were able to link with their DNA. So they were able to ID two of them. However, to this day, like six of the eight victims still remain unidentified. So that my friends is the very long story of John Wayne Gacy. He was a man with too many chances. Oh, hold on, I have a headband. Look, this is my costume, I'm cute. I'm Medusa, but I'm gonna take it off because this headband is killing me, ouch. Would not recommend. So John Wayne Gacy, dude, wild, gross, ugh. 33 victims, he got way too many chances. All of those police, all of those people who let him go throughout the years, I hope they got fired. They probably didn't because come the fuck on Bailey, but they should have, okay? The, how 33 victims and they never like, mm, let me think like, where are all these people going? It's just bizarre the whole thing. And then his wife was living under the same roof and it's like, didn't she smell anything? Didn't she smell anything? Or like wonder why they were freshly like moved dirt and stuff in the, she's like, what's that about you gardening? I don't see any flowers. It's just weird. And like, I don't want to believe that she was in on it. I don't know. I don't know. But golly gee willikers. John was fucked up, 
okay? Super fucked up and he's a super scary type because to your face and whatnot, he seemed like a super charming guy. Everybody loved him. Everyone thought he was normal and um, he was very involved with charity. Just creepy, creepy. Anyways, I would love to know what you guys think down below. What do you think of the look? Cute. <laughs> I'm all like, uh, that was gross. That's a lot. 33 and nobody, nobody thought anything. Nobody, sm his neighbors didn't smell anything. How did he not stink? Ugh. Anyways, um, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Sorry, my costume isn't really a costume, but I like this makeup look. <laughs> Let me know who you want me to talk about next week. I hope you have a good rest of your day. You make good choices. Please be safe out there. I'll be seeing you guys next week. Bye.